Uh, hey, I am Ben Ratner. I'm going to be moderating today's chat. Moderating is probably a little uh, official sounding. Um, it's really just a bunch of really cool people talking uh, here on Twitter Spaces. Uh, I've spent about a half a decade working on a popular science podcast. Um, and then when the people uh, at Twitter Spaces uh, invited me to host a space here uh, on the Twitter Spaces account, I knew exactly who I wanted to have on. Um, so as I mentioned, this is a conversation with some of my favorite scientists and science communicators. I'm going to be taking your questions about space and science. Uh, tweet using the hashtag, hashtag space on spaces so I can find them. So joining us today is uh, Dr. Katie Mack. Uh, she's a theoretical cosmologist and the author of The End of Everything, uh, in parentheses, astrophysically speaking. Um, we've got uh, Emily, uh, Emily Calandrelli, uh, who is a science communicator and host and uh, co-executive producer of the Netflix series Emily's Wonder Lab. And I believe that was Emmy nominated. Was that was that Emmy nominated? Uh, Emmys don't come out for that show until I think June twenty eighth. But uh, who's who's counting? All right, who's counting? Yeah, let's go with it. And if anyone asks, uh, I knew something in advance that may or may not be true. Um, and it looks like uh, <laughs> Hank just joined. Hank, how you doing? Good. Hello. How are you? Doing good. We're doing the intro, so I'm going to read the intro that I wrote for you. Oh, great. I will listen to it. <laughs> Hank Green is a best-selling author, a host and creator of Crash Course and SciShow on YouTube. And as I uh, consider to be his most notable achievement, he is the inventor of 2D glasses. These are glasses that take a 3D movie in theaters and makes them appear in 2D. Do you consider that to be your greatest achievement, Hank? Um, it's, it is my only invention, and, uh, and I'm glad to have one. So. <laughs> well, well, I'm glad. Um, and last but not least, we have Dr. Charles Liu. He's an astrophysicist and author of 30 Second Space Travel uh, with co-authors Karen Masters and Alan Liu, uh, as well as Intro to Physics for Babies. Charles, how you doing? Oh, great. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much for having me. It's a real pleasure to be with such uh, illustrious online uh, people. Yes, this is really just a group of illustrious online people. That's what I should have called this from the top. <laughs> All right, so uh, we are going to get to your questions as soon as possible. I'm going to ask just a few things at the top because I I'm a little selfish when I get to have uh, a bunch of my favorite science people in a room together. I'm going to take advantage and ask some questions for myself, but we'll get to all of you in just a little bit. Um, uh, just a reminder, again, use the hashtag space on spaces um, so I can find all your tweets. Um, so what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to bring up, uh, I looked through all of our speakers' tweets uh, or some of their recent tweets, and some of them came up with things that I had a few questions about um, and are kind of on the top of everyone's mind. Um, so, Katie, I am going to start with you. Now, this is not a super right. recent tweet, but you retweeted it, and to me, okay. this is one of my favorite tweets of all time. Um, I just <laughs> pinned it at the top. This, of course, uh, if you live in North America and other parts of the world, you might have experienced um, a solar or lunar or partial eclipse. Um, so Katie tweeted, using emojis, uh, lunar eclipse solar eclipse um so the lunar eclipse shows the moon then the earth and the sun the solar eclipse shows earth then the moon and the sun and then the last one which is the earth and the sun and the moon which shows apocalypse i feel like i feel like this is definitely something that needs to be seen <laughs> but, yeah um, if you scroll yeah. to the top of twitter spaces that tweet is right there for you to look at um it's did you get a... to experience the uh the eclipse at all I did not know. Um, it was not visible from from where I'm at. I'm in Massachusetts at the moment, um, but I did get to experience it vicariously through uh, a bunch of other people's photos, and um, it was it was a very it was a very clear view in Melbourne, Australia, where I, I used to live. I lived there for five years, and so a bunch of my Melbourne friends were tweeting about it and showing their pictures. And it's always amazing to see a celestial event, even if you don't get to see it with your own eyes. Um, and it's amazing to experience the vicarious joy of everybody who is watching it in person. So I, I get excited about eclipses and it is always fun to drag out my old eclipse tweet. Um, I think it's one of my most successful tweets ever. Um, just a, a sort of silly emoji joke, but uh, it, it's, it's fun. As it should be. So next, let's take a look at a tweet from Dr. Charles Liu. Um and you tweeted recently, amazing fact, the science team probably already recognizes every rock on this landscape. This is a picture from uh, the Mars uh, Perseverance mission. Um, and it is, I think this might be the first picture that came down. Charles, what do you yeah. think about Mars? Why, why is this such an exciting thing? Oh, well, uh, at this moment, 
Mars is probably the most likely place that humans will live uh, beyond the Earth-Moon system. Uh, right now, we are maybe decades or so away from really setting foot and putting boot prints on Mars. And the science that we're learning from Perseverance and all of its predecessors uh, is just remarkable. We literally have all these landing sites like Jezero Crater uh, or these other places uh, mapped down to the few feet scale. Uh, better maps of that part of Mars than Google Earth has of your backyard. And so I'm really excited to see what we discover. Uh, so far, all the experiments on the Perseverance rover that have been conducted since its landing in February have been smashing successes. Uh, in the Ingenuity helicopter has been flying back and forth uh, in up and down in ways that everyone hoped that it would. Uh, I'm just really excited about Mars. I am very confident that within our lifetimes, Ben, we're going to be up there as a species. Now, Charles, this is a question. Hank might have something to say about this. Do you think that humans are going to be on Mars by the year 2026? Oh, that's five years from now. Ooh, that's that's pretty tight. Here's, I... the, here's the situation. I made a very bad bet about <laughs> five, six years ago. And uh, <laughs> luckily, the stakes are very low. Hank hosts a podcast, uh, co-hosts a podcast with his brother, John, called Dear Hank and John. And, and the bet is that if we get to Mars by 2026, um, th it could be renamed Dear John and Hank. <laughs> not. So I, uh, sorry about that, Hank. Yeah, no. Yeah, I, I'm on the same page. I have a can I do this, Ben? Can I ask Charles a question? Oh, absolutely. I we're, we're here to have fun, ask questions, <laughs> do it all. What sure, do you Hank, think, go for it. What do you think is the biggest uh, the biggest challenge? Not like getting there, but living there. What's the hardest part of living on Mars? Uh, Mars. Well, it, it, well it's like, just it's hard. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Let me get more specific, Hank. No, it's an excellent point. <laughs> we humans evolved to survive well here on Earth. Uh, we did not evolve to survive well on Mars. Mars's atmosphere is hostile, almost non-existent compared to Earth's atmosphere. It doesn't protect us from cosmic rays. Uh, we don't have a ready source of liquid water. The temperatures are too cold. Um, you name it, Mars is an issue. Uh, I will say that um, I was incredibly uh, happy when the experiment on Perseverance showed that the extraction of oxygen from the atmosphere was so feasible. Uh, you know, that experiment ran for a couple of hours on Mars and was able to extract about 10 minutes worth of breathable oxygen. Uh, you know, you get a bunch of those running and I think we'll be in really great shape. The journey to Mars uh, is actually what I think the most difficult thing will be. Because if we land stuff on Mars, the, the various equipment we need, by the time we get there, we'll be fine. But from here to there is a minimum of, you know, six to eight months of being exposed to all the things that can kill us before we get there. Uh, so I would like to see us prep some landing area in Mars with all the things we need to survive there for a long period of time, and then get the humans there with all the stuff that they already have. I think if we do that, then the greatest challenge will be actually to get there and stay alive on the path. I don't know, Hank, do you have, a, do you have an opinion on that? I mean, there's a nice thing about space, which is that, like, uh, it can't get in. Uh, I mean, obviously, like, what, what you're worried about in a spacecraft is your atmosphere getting out. I'm worried a little bit about Mars getting into the Mars habitats and what that might do to people. Because it, once you're on Mars, if you're going outside, it's going to be very hard to keep Mars out. And I don't know exactly what Mars is made of yet. Um, we have certainly a lot of good ideas about what Mars is made of, and some of those things are definitely very dangerous. Well, that's a good point. Uh, I mean, cosmologically, though, I mean, it's got all the same sort of chemicals that we have. Uh, everything that we've sniffed on the surface since the Viking probes in 1976 suggests that there isn't anything so exotic that it, it would cause us to, like, turn into flesh-eating zombies or something. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm just worried about breathing in whatever <laughs> all the dust is made of. Oh, but yeah. We will face it. Well, let me if ask I... this question. Oh, yeah, Emily, go ahead. I was going to say, if I could add a different perspective to that, I don't think the biggest challenge of going to Mars is going to be anything technical. I think it's going, I mean, all of those problems are hard for sure. Um, I think the biggest problem 
about going to Mars is that it's going to be ridiculously expensive and unsustainably expensive, um, meaning it would just take a lot of money over a long period of time and probably require a lot of international collaboration. All of these things that we have not uh, seen traditionally and historically to be uh, reliable. So that is something I think is going to be something hard to overcome because Mars just like it sucks as a planet. It's not, it's not a good one to go to. It's the only one we've got though. So um, I think it's going to be hard to convince people to spend a ton of money to keep doing it and go there sustainably. Well, well Emily, so <laughs> one second, Charles, I just want to, so would possibly like a bake sale work to fund these missions? Like how many moon <laughs> pies would we have to sell? To get if to Mars. Krispy Kreme could keep offering uh, Mars related donuts, that might get us halfway there. <laughs> Not, don't you think just like one or two really eccentric billionaires could sustain a Mars like program for a decade or two? Not even that. I mean, the, SpaceX wouldn't exist without NASA, and NASA is not currently funded at the level required to make um, Mars missions possible. So, um, you know, we need we're we're just going to need a different level of funding to make Mars make sense. I think. All right, Emily, I actually want to jump in there. So you uh, you got into a little bit of uh, Twitter fun today uh, with uh, with a little bit of space oh funding. Uh, this. <laughs> Uh, uh, I know we have listeners from all over uh, in the United States. Um, we, we have, um, you know, the United States funds NASA. Um, can, you, can you talk a little bit about, uh, words, sorry, a little bit about uh, what happened today on Twitter? <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, today I woke up and chose chaos and my Twitter <laughs> mentions are not super fun today. But essentially, uh, there's a lot of conversation around the Blue Origin team, which is obviously um, headed by Jeff Bezos, um, disputing a recent contract that was awarded to SpaceX. Um, and Bernie made uh, a few posts about um, a, quote, billionaire bailout, I think it was, um, and sort of confusing the situation a little bit. And I think there was just a lot of confusion about, oh, why Blue Origin was disputing the contract and where the money was going. Um, and so I, I feel like it's it's probably going to be a really complicated conversation. But if anybody has specific questions on that, um, well, I, guess I would let's be just, happy to answer it. So let's let's talk about how, how um, NASA does their missions, because I, I think the, the, the core of this is that um, NASA, people say NASA sent people to the moon. NASA did this, NASA did that. But who are the actual people doing the work uh, when we say NASA does it? Great. Yeah, that's a really good question. I think something that um, people get confused about, especially because he released a video, Bernie released a video today saying something along the lines of, you know, when we went to the moon, that was this wonderful um, uh, national effort with all people contributing. But today we have these billionaires running the space program, um, which is not the case. Um, NASA has always given 80% plus of its contract of its budget away to contractors to private companies. Um, yes, those private companies operate a little differently today and have a little bit more responsibility today. But NASA has always worked with private companies. So when we went to the moon, it wasn't this nebulous effort where all Americans were involved. It was still companies like Boeing and IBM. They just didn't have these eccentric billionaires at the helm that uh, we all know and love or love to hate today <laughs> fair enough all right so um let's move on um dr katie mack uh we got this question from nyeli who a uh, asks what tf is a cosmologist whatever it sounds cool uh cosmologist is somebody who studies the cosmos um so it's it's a it's, cosmology is a a subfield of astrophysics or physics, depending on sort of which direction you come at it from. And it's the study of the entire universe uh, from beginning to end, uh, the evolution of the cosmos, what it's made of, how it works, um, all of the big questions, really. And, and in, in, in astrophysics, people who study really, really distant objects might be called cosmologists because they're studying things that are far away in space and far back in time. Um, and in physics, people who study the you know the the physics of the very first moments of the cosmos might be called cosmologists. There's a there's a big range of of what you can do and and be in, engaged in cosmology. 
you seem terribly concerned, not concerned, interested in the end of the universe. I am I am fascinated by the question of the end of the universe. I, I wrote an entire book about it. Um, it's, a, it's a really interesting question because we, we know that the universe had a beginning um, and we know that because we can see the Big Bang directly. And, and this is, I think, my favorite thing about astronomy is that we can actually see the Big Bang. We can see um, the, the time when the universe was hot and dense and fiery and just filled with plasma. Um, and that's what we mean when we talk about the Big Bang. We mean that the universe in its earliest times was hot and dense and, and in some sense smaller than it is today, and it's been expanding since then. Um, but we can actually see that because when we look far away, we're looking back in time, and we can look so far away that we're seeing parts of the universe that are, from our perspective, still on fire, still in that fiery state. So, so we know the universe had a beginning. We know it's changed a lot over time. We know that it's been evolving in various ways uh, since that time. And so we can extrapolate and see what we think it's gonna do in the future. And there are a lot of different possibilities. Um, in no case does it end well. <laughs> There's, uh, no. it's, um, there are a lot of ways the universe can die. There are really no ways that the universe can be, you know, just carry on perfectly habitable forever. Uh, it's, it's definitely evolving. It's definitely evolving to be less capable of supporting, you know, life or, or order or, you know, information in, in some sense. And um, so that's just that's just how, <laughs> how the universe goes. Um, Can it but, go to like just a farm upstate and our parents will lie to us about what happened? I mean, I mean, if, if you if you'd like to think about it that way, you can think about it that way. But um, it's uh, it really is it really is already kind of on its way to being over in the sense that like if we if we look at how stars have been forming over time in, in the cosmos, we can observe that that star formation was much more active, you know, maybe like eight or nine billion years ago. And that activity has been slowing down uh, since then. And you can work out based on the way the universe is expanding now and the fact that galaxies are crashing together less often and thus forming fewer stars. Um, you can work out that of all the star stars that have ever formed or ever will form in the future, we've already done about 90 or 95 percent. So from now until the end of time, uh, it's only the last sort of maybe 10 percent of star formation. Like we're already almost done. Yeah, but that's well, an exciting wow. 10 percent. I, I got to tell you, <laughs> as a star formation, you know, guy, right? Uh, I, I got to yeah. admit, a lot of fun stuff happening. Five billion years from now, there's going to be a whole bunch of stars formed in our own galaxy when Andromeda yeah. hits it, for example. Yeah. So I'm excited about that. And and yeah, yeah there you know, be you're, some nice ones. <laughs> you're you're of course right, Katie. Right, uh, that the the universe is slowing down. It's heading into mm -hmm. its golden years, shall we say? But yeah, I feel. Uh, a, a lot more optimistic uh, about the future than that. I mean, after all, the, the human race, uh, human species, if you count even back to the early hominids, right? It's only been around for, for a few million years. We have a thousand times that much time before the sun uh, turns red giant uh, or mm -hmm. even you know, makes us unhabitable. So if we you know, have so much more time to evolve and to learn and to, to find out things about the universe, I am hoping and and betting actually that a few gazillion generations from now uh, we're going to know enough about things like dark matter and dark energy to uh, have a much better sense and an optimistic sense about the future of our universe than we currently do now i i think we'll we'll know a lot more for sure um i i would i would not be optimistic that we'll be able to do anything about it i don't think we're going to be able to stop the evolution of the cosmos but but yeah, I mean, we have we have a billion years or so to figure out how to get off this planet and live somewhere else. And I think that's a perfectly reasonable time scale. You know, maybe slightly longer time scale than Hank is going. Yeah, but uh, let's take the first the first challenge as it comes. You know, yeah, for the yeah. red giant, and then uh, then the exactly. death, we can deal with that later. Yeah, but, yeah. Well, I mean, if Carl doesn't come and and save us first, right, Hank? I mean, I I do like to I do like to hope that there is somebody out there who's going to lend us a hand, and and so do lots of other people. The the nice thing though, is that we have been set up with these very short lifespans, so none of us personally have to deal with it. So thanks for death is all I'm saying. This is just a real <laughs> bummer of a conversation. Thanks everyone. Oh no, we we may only live a, a century or so, but you know the cicadas coming up are only going to live for about three weeks. So that's right. We're way ahead of the game. 
Oh, yeah. It's, doing good. It's all perspective. All right. Well, let's talk a little more. This is a question. I've seen um, a couple TikToks, um, particularly from uh, Emily, about this. Um, there's been a lot of what people think are UFO sightings, aliens. What's going on with all these UFOs that are in the news? Ah, yes. I think, um, Hank, I think it was you that tweeted this out recently, that one of the reasons people like us, I'm assuming all of us here, um, find it slightly Mm -hmm. annoying when headlines assume that these UFOs are aliens, um, is that it's just a very lazy assumption um, unidentified flying object simply means that it's unidentified to you. Uh, it doesn't mean that it's not identifiable by somebody else. And these videos that came out recently are certainly very interesting. Um, uh, one big confusion, big uh, confusion that I think is happening is that people are referring to them as declassified, as in they were once classified and nobody knew about them, but now they have been declassified. They were actually unclassified, so they were never classified in the first place. Um, and the report on those videos is going to come out sometime in June. So I'll be curious to see what they say about them. But I think assuming that they are aliens is uh, very lazy and uh, quite unlikely likely. Yeah, I I think that the laziness that I see in this is like if if you are trying to if there's something that's very weird, it you should be very skeptical of like something that we don't understand, which is a thing that's going to happen. You should be very like, I'm just very skeptical of any answer that could answer anything. So like any weird thing that happens, aliens could be the answer. And this weird thing happened. And it seems like and I like I get why aliens could be the answer here. But I don't know the uh, what 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 the the actual in general what happens is that there's a much more specific explanation to the specific thing rather than a general explanation that could explain anything. Which there are plenty of weird things, and there are so many weird things. And you see, like, wow, look at this brick of aluminum that was smelted thirty five thousand years before we knew how to smelt aluminum. But uh, and so that must be aliens. Or maybe it was dated incorrectly. Maybe somebody was able to do a thing that we didn't think they were able to do. Maybe it something else, something else, something else. Like these, these are little experiments that we get to learn from, and not learn. Like, and saying aliens is kind of like throwing up your hands and saying, "I wish to not learn from this," unless the aliens show up and they say hello, and we say hello, and then at that point, I am one hundred percent on board, uh, and we should start. Uh, doing our diplomacy as best we can, which I have very little faith in our ability to do. But we'll try. (laughs) For those of you interested in aliens that, well, things that may or may not be aliens that come to Earth, uh, I do got to say that is, uh, if you want to read books about it, Hank might have one or two. (laughs) Indeed. Specifically Uh, two. There's plenty of them out there. Well, oh, aliens right. really have provided a lot of the creative juices uh, in literature in the past century, for sure. Right? Aliens but... also like drinking creative juices of humans. God damn it, Ben. <laughs> 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 All right. Um, I know, by the way, I know a couple of you uh, have to leave a little early, so feel free to either jump out or interrupt who is ever talking or politely wait to say goodbye. Uh, that is your choice. I'm happy for all the time that we get with all of you. That will include me. My mom has has made tacos, and so I will I will Ooh. be leaving sometimes. For a oh, I, I had burritos today. <laughs> what? I mean, Charles, I have had burritos most days. <laughs> <laughs> a cosmic coincidence is this terrific? But um, yeah, no, actually, Hank, if if you have to go soon, I, I really want to jump in and ask you something cool. If that's okay, uh, go for it. Okay. Um, As a person who uh, talks and and communicates so eloquently about science, but may not have actually like conducted science as a a professional or a student or something like that, do you feel like there's some advice you can give those of us who actually like do science for a living? What kind of blind spots do we have when it comes to communicating such a way? I mean, you, you do such a great job of getting people excited about these things. I I feel like sometimes I I hit a wall. What do you think? Um, I mean, I've done it. So, so like I'm in the the lovely spot of having done a little bit of science. So I, I have a biochemistry degree. I have an MS and, and that, but like, and so I, and I worked in a fungicide laboratory for a couple of years. So that was like my, my science experience was very uh, practical after graduation. Um, 
and, and not research. And uh, but 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 the general answer is like talk to the talk to the people about what the interesting thing is because what and this is all even at, at this point true of me what I think is the interesting thing is not the interesting thing and and it's interesting because this also changes based on the audience that I have at the time so like on TikTok where the average person is maybe a high schooler like the things that they know about are very different from when I'm making a YouTube video for the SciShow audience who we sort of assume a college level of understanding like at least some college level of understanding of science um, and and to like switch between those modes is really an act of empathy so it's how do I understand where this person is and and get and, and because like you know all of our experience of the world is built on so many different things. And if like, I have a four year old, so like, this is extremely true where like, he can't understand something if he doesn't have like a huge base of knowledge. Like the, the, the hardest question he asks me is why are you laughing? Because that, <laughs> that's the most complicated thing in, I think in, in our, uh, in like humanity is like, why does humor work? And it relies on so much deep knowledge that you're like, well, first of all, Lauren, you're going to have to understand <laughs> that that like uh like first first i have to explain to you donald trump which is just gonna take a while <laughs> um, so so like the, and that's that that is truth with uh with, with with science communication you really have to be thinking about exactly where your audience is and and something it's good to try and have some lanes where you're specializing on particular audiences so i know that you do that with with young with young readers and emily does it with sort of older readers than that and i do it with sort of people of, of the same age as Emily, but also older. And, uh, and, and like, it's also very fun to talk to Emily in spaces where uh, the conversation is not geared only toward people between the ages of like eight and 16. So I can, I can, I can hear, I can hear real opinions about stuff. Get hot. <laughs> yeah. How do you really feel? <laughs> Thanks. That, that is so cool. An act of empathy. Uh, that's great. Thank you so much, Hank. I really appreciate that. Cool. All right. Well, let's move. Up. Oh, Emily, do you want to say something or I'll move on to another question? No, go for it. All right. Cool. Um, this question is from Tim Coster. Uh, he says, I've uh, actively, uh, actually been trying to research this for an upcoming book. If mankind were to travel to another solar system, what would our biggest threats be in deep space, radiation, etc.? And what effects would that have on our bodies? Um. Katie, is there anything at like the, you know, the scale of other solar systems that we need to be concerned about or, or measly humans not not in your immediate area of expertise? Well, I mean, it's, it's not my immediate area of expertise, but I, I do know a bit about uh, about the sort of space travel idea. And um, I think that I, so radiation is certainly an issue, although if we can figure out how to deal with that going to Mars, then we should use the same uh, the same kind of um method to worry to deal with it going farther the, the problem with going farther is just that it takes a ridiculous amount of time we don't we don't have technology now that could get us to another solar system within i don't know maybe ten thousand years i think is is a is a generous estimate and uh and you know maybe we will develop that but we're talking generation ships if we're if we're going to other solar systems and that's that's got a whole a whole slew of other uh of other challenges all right. Thank you, Katie. Uh, would any of you travel to another solar system? Like if they could like put you to sleep or whatever and you would just wake up in, you know, just another you know, solar system. Would you go? I mean, I wouldn't even move to a different country or a different city. I like it here so much. Uh, I, w and... I would go. I would go. OK, good. I'm glad somebody would. I, I would go once my kids are all grown with uh, jobs. You wouldn't take. Oh, oh, that's a lot of pressure, man. Get it <laughs> and then I'll leave. What, once they they're uh, employed and and graduated, and if my wife Amy were to come with me, I'm there. Well, that's a very kind way to put it. I would just go if it had Wi-Fi and pizza. Those would be the two very important things to me about moving to another Apple. solar system or city <laughs> or anything. Let me pull up another question here. We're getting a lot of questions coming in. So if you have uh, more questions, feel free to tweet them with the hashtag space on spaces. Um, and I'm going to take this question here. Let me press the button that makes it pop up on the thing. 
Um, and all of you can answer this, but I'm particularly interested in uh, uh, Chuck Liu's answer. Um, from Imran um, Ajman, what disaster space-related movie scenes are hilarious for cosmologists and astrophysicists? <laughs> Where do we start? Yeah, I mean, I mean, so many, so many movies do very weird things with cosmology. Um, like any time, I think the thing that I find most uh, baffling is when, when in a in a movie or a TV show, um, they encounter a a clump of dark matter and they have to they have to route around it because it's dangerous. Um, <laughs> so if you know about dark matter uh the the key thing about dark matter is it doesn't interact with you it's it's got gravity it 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 on very large scales on scales of galaxies it's important but uh dark matter is passing through you right now you don't notice it's fine it's the least dangerous thing in the universe wimp zilla's off the starboard bow right Katie? <laughs> yeah i get rock Bob to come in on that but uh yeah now emily uh, I'll go, I'll go with mine in a moment. I'll give you a hint. Bruce Willis is involved, but uh, what, what do you think? Um, I, I mean, most things in space movies are very exaggerated, which I don't know, makes them fun. But the one that I think comes up a lot is the domino effect of uh, satellites running into each other and just causing this, like this disaster debris in space just because one satellite runs into the other. And that's just at this point, not likely to happen because there is just so much space in space. They're unlikely to hit each other, but even when they are, they're unlikely to cause that domino reaction. Okay. So, so of all the ones that we can quote, Ben, you, you may have seen me do this. Uh, this is the scene from Armageddon, the dramatic one where, uh, Am I am I going to spoil this if I tell this to everybody? When did the movie uh, come out? Uh, nineteen ninety nine, something like that. If 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 you're spoiling it for people, then they have bigger problems. Okay. No, it's just when they, uh, these uh, old uh, miners are are now sent down to implant a special bomb in a uh, asteroid the size of Texas that's going to hit the Earth. And there's a problem with the lift. Somebody actually has to stay down uh, in the crack in order to set the bomb off. And so you know, the two people draw straws and you know, Bruce Willis is going to head up and Ben Affleck is going to stay down. But then the last moment, Bruce Willis puts Ben Affleck into the elevator and sends him going. And, and Ben can't do anything about it because it's all automated. And he's screaming at the thing going, no, no, no. And Ben's like, take care of my daughter for me. And Ben's like, no, no, no. That was the absolute worst scene in any space movie that I have ever, ever experienced. I'd like to imagine, Charles, that you're just quietly sitting in a kitchen somewhere, like kind of dimly lit, and I'm just seeing you just completely acting out this full scene on an audio <laughs> thing. You're not that far off from the truth. Uh... <laughs> All right, well, uh, let's get another question here um, from Weezilla. Um, can you talk about the edge of the observable universe and the research that's looked really hard at it? Who knows about the, uh, the edge of the universe? And uh, uh, Maria, if you're there, it looks like Hank either uh, exited or got pushed down to listener. So if you're gone, great. Otherwise, come back on up. Um, I, I know about the edge of the observable universe. <laughs> Tell us! <laughs> Tell me everything. Um, or just okay, some of so, the things. So, so it, it is important there to make the distinction edge of observable universe because the universe as a whole, as far as we know, has no edge. There, there doesn't seem to be any indication that anything significantly changes as you go far in any direction. Um, but there is an edge of the observable universe where the observable universe is defined as the part of the universe we can see, we can get light signals from. And the way that that space is defined is basically if you look at something really distant, you're looking at something um, as it was a long time ago because the light took some time to travel to you. So you can look at a galaxy that's so far away that the light took you know 5 billion years to get to you. The universe is about 13.8 billion years old. So if you try to look at something that where the light would take more than 13.8 years to get to you, 13.8 billion years to get to you, the light hasn't gotten here yet because there hasn't been enough time. Like 
there hasn't been enough time like ever in the in the universe um so the the edge of the observable universe is defined as the the distance where it would take light longer than the age of the universe to reach us from that point and it turns out that 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 defines a sphere around us of about 46 billion light years in radius and the reason that it's 46 billion light years and not 13.8 billion light years is that um the universe has been expanding since the beginning. So uh, something that where the light has taken 13.8 billion years to get to us is now 46 billion light years away. So it's a little bit of a weird um, thing to imagine, but there's this sphere around us. And what we see at the edge is we see the early universe. We see the Big Bang. We see, um, you know, because the light has taken 13.8 billion years to get to us, we're seeing the universe as it was uh, at 13.8 billion years ago, when it was still on fire, when it was still in the sort of primordial fire of the Big Bang. So that's what we see at the edge um, of our observable universe. And uh, we, you know, we see, uh, we see actually the time about, a, about 380,000 years after whatever the very beginning was, because we can't see through the fire. So once we get where we're looking far enough away that the universe is on fire, we can't really see, we can't penetrate into that in, in our vision but uh, there is some hope that that uh, we'll be able to pick up gravitational waves coming from a little bit farther like really right at the edge and uh, we haven't done that yet but we're hoping gravitational waves are sort of ripples in space itself from various things that happen in the universe and those can can go through that sort of fireball state of the cosmos uh, where light can't but um yeah, so what we see at the edge is the beginning. So so I guess this is a follow-up question. You're saying the observable universe, things way back to the beginning of, you know, Big Bang and everything. How do we know that physics is the same now as it was 13 billion years ago? Um, and how do we know that the observations and the uh, hypotheses that we're, we're testing are actually true? Well, so there are some things that were different about physics at the very beginning, but we're talking, you know, sort of microseconds after the very, very beginning, uh, where physics did change a bit. And I can talk about that later if you want. But there, like the, the sort of, you know, the forces of nature, the particles that exist now, that was set up uh, early in the universe in the first, you know, very few, small fractions of a second. Um, but in terms of everything else, we, we can measure some things that, that can tell us about the physics of distant objects. You know, we can look at distant galaxies and measure the spectrum of the light coming from those distant galaxies and see that, that the spectrum appears to behave in the way that we would expect um, if all of the physics of those galaxies is the same. And we can do simulations of how galaxies form and all of that, and gravity and everything seems to work the same way. Um, in those very, very distant galaxies. And so we have indirect evidence that, that none of the laws of physics have changed since you know, the, the time of the first galaxies, the time of the first light even. So, or the first light that we can see, which is the you know, 380,000 years after. So uh, we, we do have good reason to believe that, that physics across the universe is pretty much the same everywhere. Also, just want to note that the phrase, what we see at the edge is the beginning, is like the most elegant, mind-blowing, beautiful phrase I've ever thank heard. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> I, that should be on like on some Etsy like script planks that you would buy for I way should, too much I should, money. I should totally tweet it. <laughs> oh, it tweet it, get it on a shirt. Didn't T.S. Eliot do something similar like that? Like at the end of your journey, you find that you've just uh, reached the beginning, something like that? This is like the cosmological version of that. Right, right, right. Yeah. But, but the, the edge of the universe question actually brings up something I wanted to ask Katie, like real life cosmologist, Katie. So this is this is for you. Um, the There is a uh, thing that has come through, like in the popular press of late uh, around where they take the holographic principle and project it onto the observable universe itself. Uh, what, I that, Charles, just what is the holographic principle? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, this idea that the black holes, for example, uh, might have all of their quantum information stored on the interior of their surfaces so that as they evaporate by Hawking radiation, you get all that stuff back. Um, and that the stuff in the, it, it's just, uh, all right. Well, I don't want to get into anti you know, sort of conformal mapping theory or anything like that. But just to throw around a few words like crazy, uh, some people 
uh, have suggested that the whole universe, all the information about the universe is Im uh, imprinted on the interior of the cosmic horizon, uh, almost like the, the observable universe's edge. And that somehow we can use that as a, a way to think about the whole universe uh, as if we were a hologram, uh, that we even, although we're three-dimensional creatures in space, uh, all of our information is preserved on a two-dimensional surface, the interior of the cosmic horizon, uh, almost like the hologram on a credit card shows a three-dimensional object if you look at it just right, but it's just a two-dimensional surface. Uh, I, I'm skipping well, over I'll a lot. I'll have to borrow your credit card one day to see. <laughs> I, I'm skipping over a lot of it, but but Katie, you got to tell me whether like yeah. that has any legs. So so I think um, I think that what you're talking about is is this this idea that I mean it comes out of studying black holes um, and the the idea that um, well something about how information may or may not be lost in black holes and there's there's been some really interesting research recently showing that there are certain equations that, that you can write down for particle interactions where you can you can do the you can do these equations in the usual way um, uh, in a sort of you know three-dimensional space with with time as a fourth dimension and you can and you can do all these equations um, in a sort of uh, in a sort of volume and work out what's going on in that in that volume or you can do, other equations or analogous equations on the surface of the edge of that volume and you can get the same answers. So it's like you do, you do a sort of hard three-dimensional problem or an easier two-dimensional problem and you can get the same answers. And, and the, the I'm, I'm glossing over a whole lot because there's actually different numbers of dimensions happening here and it's different sort of models of, of the universe where this stuff works in. Um, but it brings a, with it a suggestion that maybe Maybe there's something really um, profound about uh, about boundaries where information can be can be stored in in sort of fewer dimensions. Um, my understanding is that that's it's not something that we can easily apply to our own universe at the moment. Um, there's th these calculations tend to be done in uh, what's called anti de Sitter space, which is a, a different kind of universal geometry than we observe in our universe, and they're sort of uh, models of, of physics that, that we don't think necessarily apply to our universe. And so they're a really interesting mathematical tool and they might be telling us something profound. And one of the profound things they might be telling us is they might be telling us that there's something about space and time that are not entirely real. <laughs> so there's that, that space and time are sort of illusory where the real fun fundamental structure of the universe is a much more abstract mathematical structure. And we just think that there's space and time. And this, this gets really, really trippy and wild. Um, but at the moment, applying it to our actual universe uh, is, is a very sort of iffy theoretical thing. And uh, as cosmologists, we, we don't do anything with that. Um, we, are, we are still... Uh, in, you know, in terms of our observations and stuff, we're we're just looking at space as though it's space, and and looking at the universe as as, as though it is real space and time, and uh, <laughs> not sort of encoded in any way. But uh, but it is something that's interesting to look out for and to to keep in mind that that the, some of these calculations might be telling us something really really profound about the nature of space and time. Awesome. My oh. brain hurts. <laughs> the, the fact that it's iffy from Katie is enough for me to, to sleep easy at night. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. All right. So we're going to go about 10 or so more minutes. So this is your last chance to get questions in. Um, I will say both Hank and Emily had to leave. Uh, they have very different uh, requirements in their life. One was leaving for a child. One was leaving for tacos. Um, so. <laughs> well, slight difference. Uh, hmm. At least it didn't leave for both a child eating tacos or something like that. Yeah, or tacos eating a child. That would that would be very sad. I would have bigger concerns about that. I think that's what the aliens are. Um, we got a question here from Incredible Boris. Is it possible to have internet in space? And what other obstacles exist in communicating while traveling in a vacuum? Oh. Well, internet in space is fine uh, because it's wireless. And electromagnetic radiation travels through space uh, without any trouble. 
uh, e even vacuum, or maybe even especially vacuum, because it's through vacuum that the uh, electromagnetic waves have their maximum speed through space, uh, the so-called speed of light in vacuum, right? Uh, the problem is that in space, there's a lot of stuff, uh, not just stars and planets, but gas and charged particles, and they have magnetic fields and things like that that get generated when they move around. And so after a few million miles, uh, you run into, for example, Jupiter's magnetosphere. Uh, and so if you're trying to send an internet signal or some sort of a wireless signal through there, you might get some bad interference. And then as you get further and further out at a few billion miles, you hit uh, the sort of electromagnetic boundary of the solar system, uh, the heliopause and the heliosheath and all that structure around it. And the ability to send a radio wave through there uh, becomes increasingly difficult. Uh, Katie, am I getting that right? I, I think that's right. I don't think we can get interstellar without uh, really running into some problems with interference. Well, you you get you do get some dispersion of radio waves if you have more sort of plasma. Um, so that's I, I don't know I don't know enough about the conditions uh, of the sort of interstellar plasma between you know systems. Um, but I think the biggest the biggest issue with internet and space is is the lag time, right? Um, so the fact that wherever you're getting information from, uh, there's going to be some delay from the, you know, light speed delay. And, uh, if you're, if you're on Mars, it could be like 20 minutes and, you know, imagine trying to load a, a web page and you have to wait 20 minutes for the, for every, you know, every command to get, get to the, um, to the earth and then, and then oh, come oh, back oh, to you. That was daily life in the AOL days. True. True. You've got mail. <laughs> Well, I'm just happy we live in a time with better internet because I can talk to all of you like this. I know. This is great stuff. All right. Well, let's talk a little more about um, things that help us get really far away. Are rockets going to improve uh, to possibly fusion and fission type engines eventually? What would make space exploration easier? So what, what kind of, how do we make, how, how do rockets go places now? What, what's their fuel source? Okay. Right now, what you have to do, uh, at least with the, uh, say, going to the moon and so forth, is to set something on fire that produces a lot of gas that moves very fast. And then it, you send it out the back of your rocket, and then your rocket moves forward, uh, thanks to Newton's third law of motion. Uh, so Arby's. For example. <laughs> um, the... Uh, the so-called uh, rocket equation uh, uh, is often described as, as having a tyranny over space travel because everything just depends on, on this one basic equation that tells you how fast you can go and how far you can go, how much extra speed you can gain when you're firing your rocket. Um, <clears throat> in the past few decades, there's been a really nice new technology where instead of firing gases out the back uh, that were caused by burning something, you instead heat it, uh, you make it go very fast by putting it through magnetic field, and then you send it uh, out the back of your spaceship uh, thereafter. Uh, this kind of drive, the ion propulsion drives, uh, don't work very well, say, near a planet like Earth, because it could produce very little delta V, as we call it. But over time, uh, if you're out in space, you can use it and it's very light and you can build up tremendous speeds over periods of weeks, months, and years. So uh, in the end, and, and I, unless Katie has some magic cosmological way to get around it, the, the biggest problem with space exploration is the fact that we can't move faster than the speed of light. And the nearest uh, objects of interest are so far away that even if we can get up to the speed of light, it would take us years, decades, generations in order to get to those places. So yeah, uh, I mean that's that's true. Although um, the closer we get to the speed of light, the the fast, the less time we feel passing. So if we if we can go a significant fraction of the speed of light, then subjectively the journey would be a little less for us. But that the the whole amount of time will have passed for the people back home. So um, depending on how fast you go, you can. If we can really, really build up speed, um, you know, accelerate constantly at a high rate for for a very long time, um, then we can we can make the journey feel shorter to us. Like we we will experience less time 
Uh, but then you have other issues if you're if you're traveling at relative six speeds because you know you could hit a grain of dust or um, <laughs> uh, something like that and that would destroy you. So you need to be, um, you know, there are, there are other challenges that you face when you go really fast. So right. so Charles, you're you're my you're my sci-fi guy. Uh, in, in the future, are we going to be more traveling like Star Trek or Star Wars? Uh, neither. Who, who, whose ship is better? <laughs> Um, okay, the realisticness of Star Trek's warp drive is closer to our reality as we understand it than the weird jump to light speed thing and the Kessel Run thing that is in the Star Wars universe. Uh, that said, it's not like the Star Trek warp drive is at all resembling reality as we know it. So it just happens to be a little more self-consistent. Uh, Miguel Acubiere, a bunch of years ago, uh, devised a sort of mathematical construction where maybe you could create a warp bubble where you could then push it along uh, with the curvature of the universe in such a way that the bubble will move through space faster than the speed of light. But that's uh, not happening anytime soon with us. So Star Trek versus Star Wars, I love them both. We're not traveling those either way. All right, let's take our last question. Um, again, I cannot thank um, both both Hank and Emily who had to leave, but Katie and Charles, you are two of my favorite uh, science people on Earth and also not on Earth because I know very few people off of Earth. Um, <laughs> so go ahead, give uh, give Katie and Charles a follow. Also uh, buy their books. Uh, Katie, Katie has uh, her relatively new book, Theoretical Cosm... Uh, I'm reading her bio, but not the name of the book. <laughs> the End of Everything, <laughs> physically speaking. Yeah, and, uh, it just out in it just out in paperback recently. So, woo, paperback, yeah. it's like books but affordable. Um, yeah. And then uh, uh, make sure you buy uh, Charles Liu's book uh, if you are a baby. Intro to Physics for Babies. If you are older than a baby, <laughs> or, or if you have a baby, that. it's okay if you have a baby too, right? What if you have a taco? Uh, if the baby is not being eaten by the taco, yes. <laughs> All right. Uh, this is our last question from Sanjana. Can you talk about what exactly happens at the center of a black hole or the higher dimensions in the universe? What exactly is that? You know, let's let's narrow this down to just the black hole. What happens at the at the middle of a black hole? Uh, we we don't know. <laughs> um, I mean, we we can make we can make uh, informed guesses. Uh, so, you know, we know that we know that. Black holes are um, are objects that have collapsed from uh, massive stars, where they've collapsed on themselves because no known uh, force in physics can stop the matter from condensing at a certain point. Once it gets massive enough and starts to, you know, lose the the um, nuclear fusion that's that's holding it up, uh, once it starts falling in. Uh, at a certain point, nothing can stop it, and we don't know of any law of physics, any any force in nature that can that can stop things from from collapsing. And so, so as you know, going from there, uh, we we uh, surmise that perhaps there is a singularity at the center of black hole. A singularity is a sort of point of infinite density where all of the matter would be just falling into this this single point at the center of the black hole. Um, but we don't really know because there's an event horizon about around the black hole, which is the region where no light or information can get out of that central part of the black hole, can come out of the, the event horizon. So there's, um, there's a limit to what we can know about black holes because we can't get any information from anything that's past the event horizon. So there are some theories that involve sort of string theory where you get sort of weird fuzzy things going on inside black holes. Um, but uh, the simplest idea that just comes from general relativity or theory of gravity is that there is a singularity and so if you if you cross the event horizon and enter the black hole you will go to the singularity and, and that's where everything ends up yeah and and the singularity for uh, a long time i think um, a lot of us thought that that was just a, a a portal out of the universe almost in the sense that it was a rip in the fabric of space-time and then once you went down there you would never come back out again but over the more recent years, it seems like that that singularity is more like the uh, opening of, say, a big water balloon, right? All the matter comes in. If the singularity kind of bulges out 
uh, into whatever space the singularity has. And then uh, over time, as Hawking radiation uh, does its thing on the black hole, it, it will wind up evaporating and then all that material sort of slowly oozes out until such point as the singularity itself disappears once the mass goes to zero. But that's a really, really, really long time from now. Right, Katie? Like... Well, I mean, I, I mean, I think I think the important thing is that that nothing survives going into a black hole. Um, like as far as we know, uh, whatever whatever happens when the black hole evaporates in the future, which we think maybe they do this. Um, maybe if you leave a black hole alone long enough, then then it'll lose mass through this um, through this evaporation. And what it does is basically it radiates uh, energy from around uh, the event horizon and that that uh, converts the mass that went into the black hole into radiation and particles that that then sort of emit from the black hole. But but you know it, it's um, it's not like what it was when it went in. <laughs> it's not like you throw in a toaster and you get out a toaster. You you throw in a toaster and you get out some photons and some electrons and positrons and and um, uh, that's that. And I mean that's that's the the big sort of issue around black holes and the and the black hole information paradox is that the equations seem to say that that. The stuff that comes out when a black hole evaporates doesn't have doesn't carry in any information about the stuff that went in. And there's been a, a a a big debate over many years about whether or not that's true. Whether some somehow the information is encoded as as we sort of talked about earlier. Um, but uh, in any case, whatever happens at the center of the black hole, you really don't want to test that. <laughs> you don't want to go in and and find out because you're probably not going to just be sort of gently transported to some other space. You're 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 going to be crushed. and destroyed and, and disintegrated. And then, you know, if you're lucky, maybe some, some record of what you were will, will emit uh, in Hawking radiation in, you know, in 10 to the 60 years or something, but that's, I wouldn't count on it. Well, that's um, pleasant. Let me just jump sorry, in Sorry, I'm, I'm just a real downer tonight. You're a real downer. <laughs> I'm just, I know I said this was going to be the last question. Um, okay. I noticed that MC Hammer happens to be listening to this space. Um, oh, cool, hey. If, if oh, you have can't question, touch that. For this cosmologist and astrophysicist I have here, we sent you an invite to speak. Uh, you're more than welcome to ask a question uh, to these uh, wonderful, wonderful people. If not, don't worry. Uh, but I figure if you are here and you have a question, uh, we, we sent you an invitation. Um, but otherwise, um, we are going to wrap up very truly up. Um, because I'm going to guess that, that Mr. Hammer has some other... Oh, we got him on! Yes! MC Hammer, how you doing? It might take a second for his uh, voice to pop up. Okay, can you hear me now? Loud yeah. and clear. All right, good, good. No, I've just been enjoying the conversation, so I um, I just stopped by to enjoy it. It's been a fantastic conversation, and uh, I'll be back next time to listen to the next one. Cool. Oh. Just quickly, do you do you have a question for for uh, about space, about the universe at all? While we have these people here to answer the question. <laughs> I have a lot of questions, but <laughs> let's get one one question before we end for the day. Oh, wow. No pressure. No, uh one question before we end. Um I don't know. I, I think my my question would be around uh, you know, expectations. Where where do you think um how long do you think we actually get to the point of uh of uh, you know, being able to stay at Mars for an extended period of time? And, and what do you think that, that we'll discover there? What, what do you actually think uh, is happening on Mars? Uh, just, be, just, just beyond, you know, going there and exploring the dirt. But there are, are a lot of theories around, you know, things that are happening on, possibly on Mars. And, you know, from some of the experts, I, I just I want to know, how does that add to what we're doing? How does that add to, add to space exploration? Like, what doors do you think will open up by us having a real presence, an extended presence, uh, on Mars via, by, by the way, when I say that, how long before we put human beings on Mars and what are some of the challenges uh, physically, um, you know, uh, on the human body getting from Earth to Mars and things like that. So that I think the latter part is my real question. What, what do, how, how long do you think it is before we can really put human beings on Mars and what are the challenges uh, physically speaking uh, of, uh, you know, what, what will happen to our bodies and how will we handle like uh, keeping us prepared where we don't, you know, lose life getting from Earth to Mars, things like that. So that's my question. Yeah, um, that's that's a great question. Um, I, I can say a little bit about this. Uh, so in terms of the timescale, 
you know, I think that we're we're a few years away from uh, solving some of the big problems for uh, for traveling to Mars. Things like how do we deal with radiation en route because we'll be outside of the protective magnetic field of the Earth and we'll have to be crossing uh, a great deal of space and the cosmic radiation and, and solar flares and things like that could be a problem. Um, and even just one of the things that people don't talk about a lot is it's going to take something like six to nine months to get there. And it's probably going to be a small spacecraft. And it's not good for people to be in confined spaces uh, in, in, you know, in sort of very constrained conditions in for the, those kinds of lengths of time. And there have been some really interesting experiments where they sort of put uh, sort of practice astronauts on uh, on a mountaintop and seal them into some kind of container and say, okay, we're gonna we're gonna leave you here for for several months and, and see how it goes. And and it doesn't always go well. <laughs> I think one of the one of the big challenges is really going to be how to deal with um, you know mental and physical health uh, when people are in a confined space very far away from other humans um, and uh, and away from the support and, you know, emergency help and, and all of that. Um, Charles, do you want to say something about like what's going on on Mars right now? Oh, well, sure. Well, first, I, I have to be like a, a wild fan and, and say thank you so much, MC Hammer. It, what a pleasure to meet you and to hear you. Uh, on, yeah, through totally. Space. I mean, it's, it's amazing. I've admired your work for, for so many years now. Uh, I'm flashing back actually to the time you you hosted Saturday Night Live and and you opened by singing too legit to quit. But <laughs> indeed, thank you. That that was a wonderful uh, just so many things. But uh, uh, to to stay with space, if I possibly can keep my mind on this right now, uh, the the thing that is happening on Mars uh, as we go there, we're setting up the technology necessary to be there successfully for long periods of time. But it's going to take decades for us to get all that technical stuff there. Once it's there, we'll be all right. But it may be it may be a full generation of humans before we get there. And one of the things I really want us to be careful about is to think about exploration of Mars and being there and having a presence there in a different way than colonization. Uh, we think now yeah. about how we colonize uh, places. Nowadays, I think uh, our generation of, of scientists are trying to say, well, let's not colonize other worlds. Let's let's immigrate to them. Let's respect what's there and find out all the cool things that are happening. And going to the question that you were talking about right at the beginning, what do you think we'll find? I feel like um, it's like if we were stepping off on a new undiscovered continent here on Earth, but just so different and not just having a few thousand or a few million years of difference in evolution, but a few billion years. I fully expect that we will find evidence of something that we might recognize as life that existed at one time on Mars, but doesn't anymore. And that may be deep underground, uh, that may require uh, looking at very special specific places, but I'm excited to sort of make that discovery and see for once and for all, when we're out there, that we're not alone. You know, it's not just us in this universe, but there are lots of really cool things and cool places that we can coexist and enjoy and learn from. Uh, thanks, Charles. That's what I was. Uh, that was the point I was trying to make on expectations on what we might uh, possibly find there. Is there? But uh, I know this is the last question. I just want to. Is, is there somebody here um, also, um, you know, dealing with quantum physics and quantum mechanics in general? Kate, Katie um, is our. Sort of, yeah. Do you have a <laughs> Do you have a specific question about that? I can see what I, I can do. I absolutely do. Um, so, so well, with respect to you know the particles, um, being able uh, to notice that they're being observed. It's almost a similar question uh, to what we expect to find on Mars, but but let me frame it differently. Uh, and I know for um, scientists, uh, depending on your personal beliefs, that also will uh, play a part in how you answer these questions. And I'm OK with that because I understand that as well. But the question yeah. is, um, nevertheless, the fact that the particles do notice that they are being observed in fact, uh, they they change you know change their directions change their behavior based on them uh notes that they are being observed that opens up a lot of doors um and a lot of a lot of questions to be answered and asked and i just wanted to get your thoughts on just the behavior the fact that the particles um themselves change their behavior when they're being noticed what is what 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 does that uh what are your thoughts on just that aspect specifically 
specifically that the particles right. themselves can notice that they're being noticed. The fact that they're that that that, that decision making is happening as a result of the particles knowing they're being uh, being noticed, and that no matter what um, phrase, no matter uh, what nomenclature uh, you, however you want to you know frame the fact that they're making decisions after they're being noticed, the fact is that they're making decisions after be they're being noticed. And I want to get your thoughts on that. Well, yeah, this is a this is a, a big, heavy question. So you're you're getting into the foundations of quantum mechanics, and this is um, the 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 way that we talk about. Hello. It, yes, can you hear me? Um, I'm yeah. Um, so the the way that we talk about it in physics is that uh, there there are there's some uncertainty around how particles are moving and things like that, and and that uncertainty. Hello? Yeah, can you hear me? Um, is there is my mic not working? No, you're coming through, Katie. Not sure if okay. uh, if he can hear you. Okay. Um. Can, uh, can you hear me, um, MC Hammer? <laughs> yeah. Well. If he can or can't, Katie, let's, let's answer that question. Okay. Okay. I'll answer uh, and the I'll question. I'll make sure that yeah. he gets that answer one way or another. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um. So basically, the way that we we talk about it in physics is that there's there's some fuzziness, some uncertainty, some. Uh, you know, sort of different possibilities for where a particle might be or what it might be doing. And that gets resolved upon observation. But it's it's not necessarily about the particle having any consciousness of of being observed. It's 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 more the interaction between the particle and the the way the the tools we're using to observe it. Um, and there's something about that interaction that that changes the the picture, that changes the behavior of particles, of, of photons, of, of any sort of quantum thing. Um, and there are lots of different ways to interpret that. One way of interpreting that is that, you know, if there's, if there's a particle that could go left or could go right, and you don't know which way it goes until you observe it, and then you see it's on the right, one way to interpret that is that the universe has actually split off into two universes where it went left in one and it went right in the other. We're in the universe where it went to the right. That's called the many worlds interpretation. Um, there's other ways to uh, think about this. There are other sort of interpretations that involve, basically, uh, there's one that, that I find really interesting where nothing, there's, there's no objective reality, really. It's just, it's how you, how you perceive reality, how reality is for you depends more on the connections, the relationships between objects and in a, in a physics sense, in the sense of, you know, if you are interacting with something else, then, then you have some relationship to that object and then, and then that changes how you observe that thing. And, and that's something that's not super weird from the point of view of physics because there are other things that are relative, you know, um, speed and time are relative and in, in, in relativity. And there, there's some, we, we, we're sort of, not super freaked out by the idea that that uh, there's no objective god's eye view but but everything kind of depends on how you're observing it and where you are um there's there's a really good book that i i just read it just came out by carlo rivelli called helgo helgo land um H -E -L -G -O. i'm reading it now i'm oh, reading okay. it now excellent yeah well that explains yeah, so the question that's yeah so that's that's an amazing book that that really goes into this this um issue and and really, you know, brings a, tell, it gives you some some grounding on, on how to think about it, how physicists think about it. And I think that I think that um, discussion is is very very good. Um, and and it doesn't it doesn't rely rely on particles making decisions. It's it's more about this this sort of interrelationship, which I think is a really fascinating idea. So, yeah, definitely check that out. Um, uh, I just did a a sort of. Uh, online author talk with with Carlo Rovelli yesterday for for Harvard Bookstore. So if you look up Harvard Bookstore, there might the video of that might be out, and you can see him him and I talking about some of those issues. So um, I would I would check that out if you're interested. Yeah, I'll, I'll definitely check it out. And th thanks for your perspective. Awesome. And, and by right. the way, we, no, that that's not where the question came from. The devil, yeah. as you know, the devil slit experience is very old. That that's uh -huh. it's, it's just yeah. It, yeah, it's very old. Uh, it's just yeah, my yeah, person. Yeah. Yeah, it's just my perspective on it. I, I, I that, yeah, yeah. that that has been my my own personal question for quite a while. Right. But but uh, but yeah, I enjoyed the book so far, and uh, I have yeah. just a ton of questions. I, I, you know, <laughs> well, we'll, we'll talk later. Um, okay, you know, in good. that space. Cool. But thank you. Cool. Yeah, well, welcome. thank you so much for popping in. We were not planning on you being here, so it was a wonderful surprise to to hear and uh, get your questions. Uh, we're going to wrap this up uh, again. Katie, Charles, 
You are two of my favorite people on the internet and in real life because I've gotten to meet both of you. Um, thank you so much for doing this. We learned so much tonight. Um, I think uh, this has been a really uh, fun, successful space. I hope everyone enjoyed it. Uh, make sure to follow Katie. Make sure to follow Charles. And I guess follow MC Hammer. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we will go ahead and end this thing. Thank, thanks so much. Magical person who ends this thing. Uh, please go ahead and thank press you. that end button. Thanks, thanks Ben. Everyone. All right. Thank thanks, you. Thanks, everyone. All right.